So welcome everyone. It's so nice that you all came tonight for this kickoff of the Jazane Festival. My name is Basma Eledisi. I am the host tonight. I'm a curator at the Orgaur Kunsthaus. And um, when I was asked to host this uh, event, um, I um, was really curious to find out more about how curators from the musical field work, because I only have experience in the fine arts museum that I work. And I already realized um, that it's probably a bit different. Um, and when we pre prepared the talk, um, I realized that, um, yes, we are going to have a lot to talk about tonight. So before I introduce the guests tonight, I want to thank the whole Jazana team and especially Anil Özdemir in the name of the three of us, I think, for the invitation and also for the trust they put in, in us to let us speak also <laughs> <laughs> on a topic <laughs> to let us speak on a topic um, that maybe for especially institutional uh, contexts, but also in the culture is maybe all at the moment um, a rather sensitive topic also. And um, we are going to talk for um, about an hour and then we're going to open the discussion and everyone here in the public can feel free to add questions or make remarks and maybe you don't feel comfortable asking them in English so you can also just ask them in the language that you like and I'm sure we're going to find a way to translate it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but we have like I think six languages like here uh, on the on the panel probably <laughs> or someone from the public has to has to <laughs> also please note that um, this uh, is being recorded so if you don't feel comfortable with that maybe you should not walk <laughs> in front of the camera um, yes um, I think we're going to start and as I already had the opportunity to hear more about Thomas Burkhalter which is the founder of Norient, and he already told me more about Norient in a, in a video call that we had. But um, unfortunately, we did not have the possibility to hear from Rami Yunis, the founder of the Palestine, co-founder, co sorry, <laughs> um, of the Palestine Music Expo. Um, how it all started with the PME, I think it is, uh, that's the short term, yeah. PM, PM. X, PMX. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, maybe you want to introduce yourself, tell the people uh, a bit more about you, and also how it all started with the PMX. Uh, thank you, Basma. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here at uh, the Jazain. And I just learned like 15 minutes ago how to pronounce the name of the festival correctly Jazain. Still wrong. Still wrong. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> how, how do I say it? Just Han. Is it just Han? It just said just Han. All right. So uh, my name is Rami Yunus. I'm a Palestinian journalist, a filmmaker, a writer, and a TV host uh, uh, from uh, from Haifa uh, in uh, what is uh, called uh, Israel nowadays. So I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Not a lot, not a lot of people know, but there are about two million of us uh, Palestinians who live inside of Israel, uh, descendants of the people who survived the Nakba of 1948, the occupation of historical Palestine. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm also a co-founder, like Basma said, of the Palestine Music Expo, which is a music event that connects Palestinian musicians from both sides of the wall, from the land of 1948, which is Israel, and also the, the, the land of 1967, which is the West Bank. Uh, unfortunately, Gaza is a unique place. We will touch on that later on. Um, and the idea behind the event was to connect the musicians with people from the worldwide music industry. We would get producers, uh, uh, booking agents, managers, people from label companies to come to the West Bank, be introduced to Palestinian culture, to Palestinian life, and what it means to create under the circumstances of the occupation, and to introduce them to Palestinian uh, uh, music and, and uh, musicians. Uh, we started the event back in 2017. It was kind of an experiment. It was me, 
uh, three other Palestinian friends that are musicians and uh, involved with music. I'm not a musician myself. I'm a cultural activist. Uh, and we had a British partner that had a label company uh, in London, and we decided to make an experiment. Let's just see what happens when we expose Palestinian musicians uh, with delegates from the industry. And um, unfortunately, we were successful. <laughs> Back then, we didn't really understand what we were doing. I mean, I just wanted to have a festival and get drunk and have fun. <laughs> Uh, but apparently we stumbled upon something that was bigger than us. And uh, we became pretty quickly, um, probably, I'm, I'm saying it's very modest, you know, like in a, and, and I'm trying to be very, as modest as possible, but we became a very well-known Palestinian festival. We got coverage in the world, like in worldwide media, uh, mainstream media. Uh, some of the delegates, this is how we would call internationals who would come to, uh, to the festival, and uh, um, we would call them delegates. S one of them even called us the most extreme music event in the world. Because for three days, we would show them occupation. We would take them to refugee camps. They would see the apartheid wall. Uh, in 2018, we went to Hebron, and uh, an Israeli settler tried to run over the delegates while we were doing a tour to Hebron. Um, so it was a very interesting, uh, uh, it was a, a, we started a very interesting, I think, uh, uh, festival. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Palestine Music Expo. And I'm also a filmmaker, and we, we just released, um, uh, my film partner and I, Sarah Friedland, we co-directed a film together, it's a science fiction documentary called Lid, that tells the story of my hometown of Lid, this is where I'm from, uh, since the occupation of 1948, through two realities. In one reality, which is based on the real life footage, it's a documentary. Uh, we tell the story since 1948 to this very day, and we show that the Nakba, the catastrophe of the Palestinian people, never stopped. And we also tell the story via an alternate reality in which the occupation never took place. Uh, so that's the science fiction part. Um, and uh, yeah, right now the film is uh, touring the world. Hopefully it will be in Switzerland soon. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was less than 40 minutes. <laughs> that was less than 40 minutes. I'm not gonna go pee now, I'm good. Yeah, we had a discussion about something. But <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot. Maybe we can come back later to also about the film uh, making, but I was wondering right now when you were talking, it was called the, like the most extreme festival, because to me, this also approach to go, um, to show also how the working conditions for the artists are in, in, in Palestine. Um, reminds me that I read about you that you have like a journalist background. Uh, yes, so you actually started uh, writing articles. Was that important when you started to, to, um, to do the festival that you also wanted to give like this back side stories? Uh. I'm, I'm, I'm being a cultural activist, not just a journalist. I was always interested in culture and I have curated a culture festival, like festivals in the past. Uh, but it all started, like I only started calling myself a cultural activist after PMX started. It was back in, 20, in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if my, my journalistic background pay, played, a, played a part in it. I mean, I'm for better or for worse, I became the face of the festival because I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> like I do media. <laughs> Later on, I had my TV show and all that. So it's like, I, it's not necessarily because I'm a journalist we started this, but because I'm involved with musicians and I'm involved with culture and I'm an activist. So uh, it was less about the journalism aspect of my life, but more about the activist in me uh, that wanted to promote this. Because I thought it was interesting because um, you, Thomas, you are also coming from a journalistic uh, background. Um, do you maybe want to also introduce yourself and give a little bit of insight on the Norient Festival that you founded like almost 20 years ago it was, yes? <laughs> yeah, not a festival, but Norient, yeah, 2002. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks, Pasma, also for the introduction, thanks Jasane, Jasane, <laughs> oh my god, to, uh, to invite us here. Um, yeah, I'm coming from, from a completely different uh, place and position 
as Rami, basically. And Norient, I started Norient 2002, uh, influenced by musicians from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh of second generation. Some people will know them, Asian Dub Foundation, Talvin Singh, Nitin Soni, uh, all these artists. I was, I was a freelance journalist back then. I was writing article after article after article after article to earn my living, and I started uh, studying anthropology. And uh, back then, you could still earn some money from articles, so I stayed in London for a year and met a lot of musicians. And from anthropology, I also read the book uh, Orientalism by Edward Said. And uh, yeah, I thought that the non-West is misrepresented, that the non-West should not just be about exotic things, Orientalism, things like this. And from this and from all the jokes that the Pakistani and the Bangladeshi and the Indian musicians uh, made during our interviews about exotic things, I somehow started creating this platform called Norient. It was called No Orientalism, uh, Disorientation. In 2002, it was an attack. For me, it was an attack on world music because I was very critical, uh, critical about world music back then because I felt that artists are pushed into a costume to work, to, to function on the European market. And so I, I, yeah, I decided to create my own platform. It was a blog. I started it alone. The first picture of on Orient was uh, the Tahrir Square in Egypt, strangely enough, because I, for a reportage, I, I uh, interviewed, I searched for underground musicians, experimental artists in Egypt, and then in Beirut as well, so I spent a lot of time in the, in the Middle East. I never worked, uh, I, 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 tra I traveled to Israel and Palestine, but I never worked there, but I worked a lot in uh, Egypt and, uh, and, uh, and Beirut. Um, yeah, that's where it comes from, and I think we will talk a lot about politics of curation. I think Norient is in a way, in, was, and maybe still is, not in your face uh, politics or in your face activism. It was more uh, giving platform to voices that themselves, they are super political often, but often they have also different uh, opinions. And first of all, it was about music, it was about uh, contemporary music, stuff that we thought is exciting. Uh, yeah, and it grew. We started a festival in 2010, the Norient Festival. It was a bit like your festival. It was, it was beautiful from the beginning. It, it always, everything worked. We were not on these uh, mainstream media, but we were in the underground media worldwide, basically on Wire magazine and stuff, maybe not on BBC and CNN. Uh, there is, might be also a difference there. Uh, yeah, I think I stop there for the moment. <laughs> there, I could talk a lot, but I don't know where to go. Let's wait. <laughs> Thank you. But um, as I understood it, there is really also the, uh, there was a, a big interest in having a decolonial approach also in, in curating the festival. Um, how like political was the whole idea? I mean, you said it was like a, a, an attack a bit, but was it like really consciously uh, a, a political act to, to start the, the whole, I think you call it once a community project, Norient. Uh, I mean, it changed, it basically changed over time, I, first of all, the artists that would be on our platform, uh, it was political for sure, because it was very critical about how the West or the, the Western market saw the Arab world or Africa or Latin America. We didn't work too much with Latin America somehow. No one could speak Spanish. And uh, so it, 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 was, it was for sure political. And then the political side about uh, curatorship was because I'm basically a, a music lover and I'm a, I'm a nerd. I, I dig, you know, I, I'm just searching, 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 searching till I find interesting artists. So I would be in, in Egypt where everyone would tell me like, oh, there's not really an underground scene and I would just not believe it. And I would just ask. And then slowly, slowly you start finding the, the crazy people that sometimes today are super super famous. Back then, they were somewhere in a small house 
doing recordings of the streets of, of Egypt on mini discs, you know. Uh, so, it, and then also supporting, bringing these artists to, to Switzerland was and is a political act because often they were not from the elite families or something. So if you try to get a visa for them, it was super difficult all the time because at the, at the, at the embassy office, you would not have the, the, the Swiss people at the, at the counter. You would often have Egyptians, for example, at the counter that would say, but this is not an artist. This is like, it's just a young person doing strange things in a way. So it's super difficult to, to get, it was super difficult to get these visas. And so we tried to see, do we know someone at this embassy, basically? And you ask everyone and then suddenly you know someone who knows the ambassador and then suddenly it works. It's like this, basically, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's really like this. And the collective thing started, mm, started more, I did a PhD about underground music in Beirut. I stayed yeah, one and a half years in Beirut, uh, 2006, when the war was between Hezbollah and, and Israel. And uh, back then I started thinking like, even though I, I met like 150 artists and people from the creative industries from different generations to, to let me inform about, uh, about this book that I also published on, on Routledge in the US. Uh, I still found like it's, it's crazy, Thomas, that you are in a way defining the Lebanese scene because there was nothing really out there, no book. So I started involving other uh, scholars and writers and journalists. I started sending the tracks that I was discussing to different people so that their opinions would become part of the book. So it became a patchwork. And at Norient also, it was always like, uh, we tried to involve a lot of different writers on the platform that we have contradictory articles, sometimes on the same scene. Young, uh, young writers, old writers, different generations. And then the festival, I curated it for many years, like 13 editions or so, no. 10 editions I created alone, and then I decided to give the curation to an international group of artists from uh, Nairobi, from Delhi, London, Zurich, different places. And so in a way, this, this collective curating comes in into Norient more and more. But we are, still, we are still, in a way, based in Bern. Most of the funding still comes from Bern, so there is still it's still not an ideal, an ideal world. We are still the ones that know we have money or we don't have money. It's still us that decides we work with them, with them, with them. But we try to engage in different ways of how to create an event, basically. Rami, did you, when you started the Palestine Music Expo, was it like behind the idea also a bit behind to be your own voice? Just like, I mean, when you said it's weird that you were giving a voice to like maybe music that is not so popular um, all around the world, was it like the idea to be to do this, this or? So uh, in one of the trips leading to uh, the inaugural event of PMX back in 2017, I think it was at the end of 2016, we we. We brought a uh, few professionals from the music industry to Ramallah in the West Bank to meet Palestinian musicians. Uh, the former editor of Billboard magazine was there. And he was asked by one of the musicians, should I sing in Arabic or English? What do you think? And then the editor, the former editor, gave a brilliant answer. He said, I don't give a shit. <laughs> said as long as, as it's yours. Because you have to understand, as a Palestinian artist, you can tell a story that no other artist anywhere in the world can tell. So it doesn't really matter how you choose to tell it, as long as you choose to tell it. And I'm here to help you convey that message to the rest of the world. So yeah, in a way, it was about us 
you know, voicing ourselves, but it also about, you know, challenging the occupation because the occupation isn't just about occupying your land. It's about occupying your identity. It's about erasing your identity. And how do you erase an identity of an entire people, of a nation? You try to erase the culture as well. So in spite of the occupation, we would bring these people, connect them with, you know, Palestinian musicians, show them that we are human beings as well. Because unfortunately, and I'm saying this as a, again, as a Palestinian who's a cultural activist, we need to keep reminding the world that we are human beings as well. <laughs> unfortunately, this is the case. We need to keep humanizing ourselves. And what is more humanizing than music? You know, these uh, uh, delegates that we would bring to Ramallah and these journalists would see Palestinians like dance and have fun and, and play music and sing and produce music and have this fantastic event. One of the co-founders of Glastonbury Music Festival, you know, probably the biggest music festival in the world, he was amazed by the level of professionalism that we had in the production. Um, we would change acts within 20 minutes, and he would say that even in Glastonbury it would take them longer, and we were able to pull it off like every single night. And he was amazed by it. He was like, how are you able to do that? It's like, I mean, yeah, I know that on the news you only see us in one certain context, but we can do other stuff as well, and we can do it pretty well if we get a chance to, you know? Um, so, yeah, it was about, you know, giving a voice. It, it was about showing the world how we live. And yeah, we also took advantage of this event. I mean, yeah, you can bring people over and tell them, we want to show you what occupation is really all about. Maybe, you know, out of 100 people, you would get maybe five yeses, you know? Five people would say, yes, I want to come. But when you tell them, want to come to a music festival in Ramallah? They would say, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to come. This is interesting, this is sexy, you know? But then you show them apartheid. Then you show them Israeli army, then you show them checkpoints, then they sh you show them refugee camps, then you take them to Hebron, and you show them how Palestinians, I was about to say live, but you know, well, try to live uh, under racial segregation. Uh, and then at night, you show them festival, you show them music. You show them Palestinian musicians, you show them Palestinian art and culture. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was about, you know, being connected to the world directly without, you know, having the occupation to play as uh, um, not an intermediate, but as a barrier between us and the world. Yeah, that, in a way that's completely similar. It's also, that was also uh, an orient about to show people in Switzerland, for example, that these are people out there, not so different from you and me, you know, that have uh, dreams, visions, hopes, unfortunately, traumata as well. Uh, and, and sometimes I'm, st I'm still amazed that people don't get that, you know. <laughs> I find it strange. And for, for me, an orient was also about... Switzerland is like the richest island on earth, maybe, or one of the richest, richest, most rich islands on earth. And Bern is a nice place, but it's also a bit boring. And uh, so for me, it was also in a way to try to internationalize <laughs> Bern and Switzerland, you know. And Make it less boring. Yeah. So it's very selfish at the end of the day. Sometimes I think, yeah. It's the old anthropology joke that he's too bored in Switzerland, so he has to travel, <laughs> which has maybe, a, it has something, but I don't think it's just bad, so I don't know. We can discuss later. But you have to understand, when we, when we talk about Palestinian culture, I mean, certain, certain cultures are associated with very unfair associations, you know, uh, and, um, and 2019, I curated a Palestinian culture festival that was 100% funded by the state of Israel. I was able to pull it off. It's a very, very long story. Back then, the minister of culture was a fascist Israeli uh, minister, and now she's a minister of transportation. 
Uh, so she's a member of the uh, of the current Israeli government, and I'm sure you all watch the news and you know what the uh, current Israeli government is all about. Um, and I found a way to get hold of funding within, you know, uh, uh, from the Israeli government. And mind you, we are Palestinian citizens of Israel. We are taxpayers. We deserve that money. You know, we deserve these funds to have it back and to start our own initiatives, cultural initiatives. Back then, I had a brilliant idea to just like have a Palestinian culture uh, in the city of Haifa, which is up north, north and of historical Palestine slash Israel. Uh, she came after me, the minister came after me, and um, you know, the right-wing activists came after me and after the festival, but we were able to pull it off. And they were, you know, the, you know what the, their main talking point against us was that it was culture, it was a festival about violence. It was a violent festival. Why? Because we had the audacity to call it a Palestinian festival. So for us, you know, whenever you want to support, whenever you want to celebrate your art, your culture as a Palestinian, you work against this propaganda machine that tries to tie, you know, your culture, your art with negative connotations like violence. You know, so it's kind of like the Israel establishment lies about your culture and then they believe their own lies and they expect the world to believe their own lies as well. Um, have you ever been like criticized for organizing? Me? A, no. A, no, for organizing a festival that <laughs> that um, shows only Palestinian, like exclusively Palestinian artists. Who would criticize me? Israelis? Yeah. Maybe oh yeah, that's that's a funny yeah that's a funny that's a funny point. I mean, we would approach, especially I think the first two years, uh, if we're talking about the Palestine Music Expo, we would get you know Palis Israeli musicians and you know Israeli producers, whatever people from the Israeli industry, they would see the big names we would get. I mean, Brian Eno was a guest in 2018. James Ford won three Grammys. Was a huge music producer, and you know he produced. Uh, uh, um, uh, the Arctic Monkeys and uh, Florence and the Machine, the Pesh Mode, and and he was you know one of our delegates. We would get like really huge names, and we would get you know Israeli musicians and Israeli people from the industry come and approach us and say, yeah, we want to be a part of this. We want to do a festival about peace and coexistence, and well, go and start your own festival about peace and coexistence. This is about Palestinian space. This is about a Palestinian art, Palestinian culture. And so, yeah, I wouldn't call it really, I w we would brush it off. It it's not really criticism, but it's, you know, Israel is trying to be also part of this. And, um, like, you were talking about getting visas for the artists. Like, what are, like, the maybe some of the difficulties, difficulties oh, that you Gaza. have to... Yeah. Gaza. Yeah. Gaza. So, uh... A I'm not going to talk about the you know, current genocide at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk about the festival. Uh, in 2019, we were able, with the support of um, uh, the, German, the German fund called GIZ, a German support fund that's, that's in the West Bank. They were like one of the sponsors of the Palestine Music Expo. We were able to get uh, permissions to have uh, 14 Palestinian musicians from Gaza to enter the West Bank and come and showcase their music at the Palestine Music Expo. Um, we filed for 21, the, like, you know, um, visas, I'd call them. Um, only 14 were approved. And there were like five bands, but they would get like, you know, from each band, they would get maybe two people or three people. So it was a big mishmash of musicians and you know, missing bands, you know, missing musicians. So, uh, so yeah, it was it was it was very touching. And you know, out of these 14 musicians, I mean, I think all of them, it was their first time leaving Gaza. It was their first time leaving Gaza. And I don't know how many people of you have been to Ramallah, but it's not really a city. It's like a big village. But to the people who left Gaza and you know, seeing Ramallah for the first time, to them it was like the big city. So it was very touching, and at the same time, we knew that they had to come back. So we told them, you know, don't get, you know, <laughs> don't get, you know, too fascinated by the city lights. 
so to speak. You have to go back to Gaza at some point, and uh, some of them didn't. Some of them decided to stay, and um, yeah. Yeah, now, now some of them are actually in Turkey. Uh, and um, yeah, there were always issues with getting Palestinian musicians from Gaza to the Palestine Music Expo. In 2017 and 2018, we couldn't. We just couldn't, even though we tried. Yeah, in 2018, um, Gazans started the Great Return March. It was on the news back then, six years ago. They decided they had enough with the blockade, with the siege, and just decided to march to the border, to the fence from Gaza, to the fence with Israel, every Friday. Now that coincided with the Palestine Music Expo. So how can you have a music festival while hundreds of thousands of people are marching to the fence, probably, some of them, to their death? Because when we saw that happening, Israeli soldiers started shooting them. Um, so um, we didn't know what to do back then. Like, I mean, this is a big production. It's a costly production. We had internationals coming to visit. I mean, how do you, what do you do? Do we still do the festival? We decided to still do the festival and to let the organizers of the Great Return March in Gaza that we are doing the festival because this is about celebrating our culture and we would give them shout out on stage every single night. And uh, yeah, we had their blessings and we, we, still did the, we still did the festival. Obviously not all Palestinians understood this. We were criticized back then for some, some of them criticized us, um, mainly from the conservative side of the Palestinian society for having a festival while people were being shot. But I mean, yeah. When, 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 when you, it's not just about having fun. And, and celebrating and party and all that. It's about showing the world we are alive and we celebrate life. Thanks. Um, when you were like mentioning this about the, the people also maybe, yeah, I don't know, like canceling cultural, li cultural life a bit. Um, I'm also a bit reminded of like boycotts um, because I mean, there's also the idea of, yeah, maybe like if sometimes if we don't invite certain people to to um, to a festival or to a venue, then um, it will be maybe also give the voice to the people people that actually need it. So um, I was wondering if maybe you would also like maybe talk about the. Uh, yeah, the boycott situation. Maybe also, yeah, of, of people saying it's not the right time to uh, celebrate um, at the moment, but also about um, boycott in itself, like uh, boycott maybe also Israeli artists. So, uh, well, the, the, the boycott movement doesn't boycott individuals. It boycotts the Israeli establishment. Uh, if an individual is anti-occupation, anti-apartheid, and they are an Israeli, then there's no reason to boycott them. Uh, so there shouldn't be a problem with that, and but you know when you talk about the boycott movement, not a lot of you know activists who mean well and support BDS, the boycott movement. Sometimes you have to understand that you need to have a leverage. You know, just saying I want to boycott for the sake of boycott doesn't really it's not it doesn't work what, like in each and every case. You need to understand that okay, you boycott, but you need to have a plan. You need to have leverage. And this is not the case in, 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 in many cases, uh, I, I, unfortunately. Uh, again, with us, it's easy. I mean, we, we are, I mean, for me, w with me, you know, personally, it's very easy because I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. I mean, who's going to boycott me? I mean, <laughs> where do I go? What do I do? I mean, I don't, I don't really have a choice, you know? Uh, so no one can boycott me. I can boycott people. But again, as a Palestinian and as a Palestinian who supports the boycott movement, I don't boycott people, I boycott institutions. At the same time, I can't boycott the Israeli institution because I have an Israeli passport, I have an Israeli citizenship, I pay taxes to the Israeli income, to, to Israeli tax authorities, you know, and which is, you know, sadly enough, um, our taxes fund the killing in Gaza and the killing of our own people. We live in a very, very fucked up situation. And um, yeah, 
I, I don't have much to say about the boycott at the moment because I believe that we just need to stop the genocide. I don't think boycott is enough. I think more needs to happen. Um, did you, uh, have you ever been in the situation um, of maybe where you refuse to work with an institution because maybe, I don't know if you could call it like moral standards, but that you were, it didn't feel right for you to work with that institution? Uh, not really. I mean, we, we worked with artists from, from both sides. We worked with leftist Israeli artists, Meira Asher, Eran Sachs, David Oppen, Opp. But also we worked with Camilla Joubran, the Joubran brothers and, and everyone. I mean, we tried we tried in the last in the, since uh, since uh, the last year we didn't work in in the field too much. Uh, before we would try not to work with artists that clearly are supported by the Israeli state or by Israeli funding institutions. That was a bit our our thing, but uh, it's difficult to really. Uh, to really look so closely. So basically, you will need to research every artist super closely. What, uh, for whom and with whom did they work before? It, it, it's difficult. Uh, so I guess with artists in war zones, we would try to make, to do our research better than with others. I would put it like this. Yeah. And then you, you get help from like, people living there or how do you might also, might also be the question when you work in Ghana for example or, uh, yeah you would ask for example I would ask like in, in Lebanon sometimes there were discussions so you would ask all your artists friends what what do they think of this and that so you would ask around yeah but yeah uh, I don't know also with boycotts uh, I think boy Boycotting, or I think I, I might be a bit on, on, on your line there. I think boycotting individuals might be tricky, and artists especially, because artists sometimes also are people who, who are maybe also important in Israel, you know, that support uh, the Palestinian case. There aren't many of these. They are not many. We also uh, didn't work with lot, many. Yeah. I mean, the the Israeli art scene is incredibly disappointing in that sense. Yeah, I, know. I mean, they don't really talk against the establishment. They don't really criticize the establishment. And the ones that do stay in the fringes. You know, they never become mainstream. Yeah, that's the artists we work with, basically. Yeah. yeah. But, like might be a very personal question, but did you like decide to to do this for reasons of like personal reasons? Or was it um, more the case that you were afraid of maybe bad publicity? Um, because we had, when we were talking a bit, we also talked about maybe climate um, organ um, uh, organizations or working for the climate. And then you also sometimes think, oh, I don't want to work with this person because maybe they are not like, yeah, they don't have like the same opinion as me in, in this in this case, so. No, it's uh, political reasons. I mean, yeah. I was in Beirut in 2006, as I told you. And back then, you know, I became very activist, you know? We were, I was very angry about the Israeli state and what they were doing. I was not pro Hezbollah. <laughs> I was not pro Hezbollah or something, but angry. And we would write uh, blog articles and stuff, and suddenly you become quite well known. Everyone, every radio in the world wants to talk to you, which is also a bit strange. And uh, so since then, I just knew I don't want really to support stuff that is supported by the Israeli state. That's that's the reason, yeah. Um, uh, when we talk about like the the also political side of uh, um, that you organize something and you're really fond of it and you have fun with it, um, maybe you 
some people also they don't keep in mind that these are like the artists are also like people um because for me political working political also means that uh, you are a bit responsible for the artists that you show um so i thought it might also be interesting to ask how responsible do you feel for the artists that you work with I don't feel responsible for them, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, the big boys and big girls, I'm, I'm not responsible for them. Um, I mean, it's just like you put on a show, you know? You just put on a show and you hope for the best. And then you just follow up on media, media coverage. And this is where the big headache starts. I'm going to tell you a story. So the first time we did the Palestine Music Expo, uh, The Guardian, you know, uh, the newspaper, the English newspaper, sent a journalist to cover the story. It was his first time in Palestine. So he was with us. He attended all the, you know, activities and all the tours, and he saw occupation in his own eyes. And he wrote a story about the uh, Palestine Music Expo. After the story was published, it was taken down by the Guardian. Do you know why? Because he had, the writer, the journalist, had the word apartheid in that story seven times. And apparently, the editorial staff in The Guardian didn't want the word apartheid associated with the occupation, you know, so many times. So back then, we didn't know what to do. Do we make a big stink out of it? You know, I mean, this is our baby, this is our festival. And finally, we got coverage in mainstream media and, and you know, the people are talking about us and we're getting this, you know, attention and all that, but it was taken down. I mean, the guy wrote apartheid because that's what he saw, you know, racial segregation, and he wrote about it, that's it. So we didn't know what to do. Do we make a big stink out of it or we, we, we do what? We negotiate with the, with, the, with the media outlet to bring it back on? So we decided to stay quiet and quietly negotiate uh, to bring the story back on, and they did. And instead of having the word apartheid in that story seven times, it was featured, I think, only twice. Back then we said, okay, we have a bigger fight here. You know, the word apartheid was still there, but we wa also wanted to have focus on Palestinian music and Palestinian musicians. We wanted the festival to have its effect, to do its effect. And I think we were right because, you know, the years following, we were still a success and we were still able to get, you know, real media coverage uh, on this initiative. So I never feel responsible for the artists themselves, you know, um, but I do feel sometimes somewhat responsible for the coverage afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I feel very much responsible for the artists. Um, but again, it's a, different, it's a different position. I mean, for example, at the moment, I'm working with some artists in Bangladesh and also the Maldives, strangely enough. Uh, and there is very difficult political situations for them. And whenever we publish something about them, it can put them in danger, basically. So when we, when we uh, publish an article, I'm working on a podcast, on podcasts at the moment, I would send it back to them five times almost, you know. Even after the, after the interview, people always tell you, just publish it. I'm, I can stand by my word, you know. But sometimes, I mean, you talk to an artist for one and a half hours, and if it's a good interview, it almost becomes like a therapy session. I don't mean it in a, in a negative way. It really, it can be intense. And artists would open up suddenly and say things that they forget what they shouldn't say sometimes, you know. And so that's why when you finally edit the interview, you really have to, you have to send it. And it's sometimes, it's disappointing because you have these amazing quotes <laughs> there that you would love to publish, but I would never do it. So yeah, part of the things we do, because again, we don't have an industry, we don't have an infrastructure to have an industry. Before you have a music industry or a film industry or any kind of you know, art industry, you need to have an infrastructure. How can you have an infrastructure when you have occupation? It doesn't really work. So our artists need to learn how to work properly. And this is where you know, delegates from the you know, industry 
uh, uh, come into play. We learn from their mistakes and they learn from the good things that they do through workshops, you know, uh, 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 and, and so on in, in, in the festival. Uh, so yeah, part of the you know the reason to do this is to professionalize our our musicians. Mm. Um, also, you are both working in the film uh, genre, um, field, and um, I was wondering if maybe I can ask the provocative question: um, Do you think that music is less? Political than film? <laughs> uh, so very... Well, everything is political. Everything is political. I don't think, I don't think it's a competition. Uh, everything can be extremely political. I mean, it's not just... And it's not just the actual like end product, whether it be it a music album or a finished film. It's the process. It's the process of doing that thing, you know, finishing that thing. I'd been working on my film for eight years. Eight years. You know how hard it was to get funding for this? If I were an Israeli, you know, making a film about the Nakba, the catastrophe of the Palestinian people, you know, people would come to me, fund me, and say, you're so brave. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for doing this. But I'm a Palestinian. And I made a film about the catastrophe of my own people from the victim point of view. People don't want to touch me. <laughs> and once the film is out there, it is viewed as very political, as very contra controversial. I mean, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm not an Israeli. I'm a Palestinian doing this. Um, so, again, I don't think necessarily, you know, that films are more political than music or vice versa. Uh, but the process of, you know, you know, getting that finished product out there can be extremely, extremely political and extremely hard, uh, depending on your background and the message that you uh, want to convey. And again, if I were a Palestinian um, doing a film or making a, a music album about peace and coexistence with Israelis, I would get funding like that, like that. And we, I have many examples, you know, um, on, on Palestinian musicians who decided to just like put other values aside and, you know, promote empty values instead. And when I say empty values, you know, coexistence, peace, this is the language of the occupier, the language of the privileged. Whereas the occupied will talk about justice. And then they get silenced by the occupier. So if you are a true artist in Palestine, whether you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel or a Palestinian in 67, which is Gaza or the West Bank, or the diaspora, everything you do, if you're true to your own values, everything you do is political. Mm. That's why in the beginning I said we are not directly, in a way, political, but we are super political because we, we would focus to find artists that create their own their own music, their own language almost, and this personal language is political often. We would always be afraid of, I, I used to call them NGO projects, basically, like all these uh, peace building projects, Israeli rappers and Palestinian rappers that come to Switzerland. We would, we would never work with that, and I also fe often felt bad also for the artists, you know, because you have these rappers from Ramallah also, that would love to meet the, the Swiss hip hop scene, but they uh, perform like in this in this aula in a, in a school in front of people between 30 and 70 years old, you know, which always is a bit strange. I feel bad for the Palestinian artists in that in that in that sense. I really feel bad for them. I don't blame them. I mean, I'm I mad also at don't blame. I just wouldn't work with yeah yeah with this. I, yeah. I, I fully understand that I wouldn't work with them myself, and I'm a Palestinian. You know, I, I get mad at them, but I, I, on the other hand, I do understand them. I mean, again, they want to travel to Switzerland. What, they what, need are, to, what other options do they have? They need to earn money. Exactly, you know, so I feel for them. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I do see many artists, majority of Palestinian artists don't make art that way. 
how political is uh, the payment that you do? Like, do you think it's uh, but like uh, uh, the, the fees that you pay? How political is money? Like, uh, um, what do you think I pay? <laughs> do you think I have money? <laughs> <laughs> Like when you invite artists for a, for a festival, we don't pay, no. Uh, it's like well, no, we don't we don't pay the artists. Uh, uh, the like we put them on stage and we give them a chance to showcase their music in front of people who could really promote them. Uh, the first year we did, you know, we did PMX. We had, I think, 18 musical acts. Uh, nine of them, I don't remember really. I think it was eight or nine were signed. And usually in these, you know, expos, these, you know, events that showcase music, you know, and the, you have these events all over the world. Usually only 10, 15, maybe at best 20% of the musical acts get signed. With us, it was almost, it was 40 or almost 50%. Um, so this is the payment that we provided with, with, with the festival. So, uh, no, I mean, I don't have money. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, um, but you, I mean, you have also many have artists. Money. Yeah, you know, but uh, you have many artists coming <laughs> from abroad. Um, this is also a question. Can I be in your festival? This is always a question. Like um, you, you probably pay them Swiss Swiss uh, uh, fees or. Uh, yeah, we also don't have so much money. I don't know if we compare. I mean, Brian Eno, we couldn't afford, so maybe you have more. Than us? No, Brian Eno supported us actually. Brian Eno supported us. We oh. didn't pay for him. He oh, cool. he paid us. He gave us money. Perfect. But I'll sing about peace coexistence if you'll have me at your festival. I mean, can there I There is come? there <laughs> is the, there is actually the rumor that Brian Eno is a fan of Norient. I heard it twice. Could, can he? you ask him once? Uh, yeah, I would well, I really like to know. Yeah. Well, let's ask him. Yeah, if you meet him because I will never meet him. We'll email him now. We'll see. <laughs> now anyway, uh, money uh, for us, no, definitely it's an important thing, you know, we try to uh, pay everyone involved in Orient. That starts with the writers, for example, on, on the Orient platform. I'm somehow very critical sometimes about, uh, for example, internet radios in London or stuff, NTS and all these radios, I love them. But it's crazy because like everyone works for free there, you know? And also music magazines, like you have all these young writers that work for free. So basically, cool, you promo you're promoting underground or niche cultures, but you don't pay, I don't know. Maybe the NTS people also don't get so much money from it, I have no idea. Anyway, we tried always to, to pay. And uh, also in the festival, for me, it's important that we don't overdo because basically you have a budget and you can decide so, so much money goes there, so much money goes there. So we try in a way not to put too much uh, money into program leaflets, banners, things like this. Because sometimes I feel there is, there is festivals that put a lot of money in representation and inviting curators from all over the world. We never do that. So we, in a way we try to have a budget that at least a good amount goes to the artists. Yeah. I mean, as good as possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always also. I mean, when you you say you're coming from a non-institutionalized context, uh, that's always <laughs> an issue. <laughs> so maybe I uh, just come back because I'm I'm. Uh, not quite sure if uh, you understood my question about the cinema, right? Because um, I was just wondering, some people, they think, oh, music festivals, it's all fun, it's like dancing, and it's like happy time. But many people don't really realize that also the music is has like probably also context that is about politics, and it's just like wrapped in a, in a more, more maybe harmless um, way. So... Do you feel like, uh, because you both do mo movies, do you feel like it's different with movies that people are like more critical of the, the, the political message behind the movie? Because that's what I kind of got when you were talking about the, the situation of the funding also for the movie. Because people, they look more also at the story. They are not just like, oh, this is a, a, a musician, he makes fun music and you're giving him a platform and or whatever. Um, do you think there is like a, a difference between these like two fields? 
a very deep question. <laughs> I mean, again, if you look at music, it depends on how you view things because an artist has a story. It's not necessarily the, the album they produce. It's also like their life story. It's also the story they tell in interviews and what their songs really tell, you know? Whereas when you watch a film, okay, so you watch a film, if it's a feature, more than 60 minutes, you just in front of screen and that message of the filmmaker is being relayed to you in this big frame of 60 minutes at least, you know? So you get a chance to really think about the message, to really, th the filmmaker gets a chance to really maybe instill the message they wanna instill in you, you know? So you, I don't know, but I mean, I don't know, it's a really good question. I don't think I have an answer for you because it really depends. Um, if you're a Palestinian musician, if you're a Palestinian filmmaker and you made a work of art to the world, first and foremost, you are a Palestinian. So whatever you did is political. You know, one, uh, a very famous Palestinian writer and filmmaker, uh, Suha Arraf, uh, told me once, if you want to write fiction, do me a favor, just don't write about the occupation. And then when I asked her why, she said, because it's going to be there regardless. You know, it's going to be there in the subtext because it's part of us, it's part of you. So write a love story. Write a funny, like, comic story, right? Just do me a favor, do not write about the occupation. And uh, what did I end up doing? <laughs> I made a film about the occupation. <laughs> and that's where maybe where music comes in. I mean, music is maybe a little bit more independent. It's a bit less, uh, you have to go through less funding bodies and people who decide this is possible or not. This is not funded, this is funded. So, uh, yeah, you have bedroom producers uh, who, who can uh, tell their story in direct ways, in super hidden ways, with metaphors, like, and artists are super smart, you know, like, so, some so of just them. some of them, yeah, some of them, yeah. I don't know, maybe everyone is, in a way, <laughs> super smart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you, you create something and you try to, and you publish it, you know, you put it out to the world, which is already like something it's in a way something bold, you know? You try, you try to make a living with something that your parents thought you shouldn't do, basically. So why? Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends on the message again. Depends on the message. Depends on who you're trying to please, uh, who, you're try, who, who you're trying to appease. So it's, it's, it's very, I think it's, it depends on the actual work, yeah. Yeah, but who judges? what is a good story and what is a bad story, and what you shouldn't hear and what you should hear. Mm. But yeah. Okay, so we, just, <laughs> we were just talking about, uh, uh, you know, Israeli artists and, like, Palestinian artists who, like, you know, join forces and, you know, make films about, you know, peace and so on. You know how many times the Israeli government, you know, tried to fund such projects? Again, because it's the language of the occupier versus it's not really the language of the occupied. And what do they end up doing? They end up doing really bad art. Because art is supposed to be critical. Art is supposed to be, I'm not going to say anti-establishment, but it's supposed to make us ask questions rather than you know, give answers. And when you have uh, an establishment or an institution, especially if it's a racist one, you know, come and fund your work, most chances, this is not going to be a good work. I agree, yeah. I agree, there's also artists that are very good in, in putting funding applications inside, yeah. and uh, who, get, who know how to get the money, and these are not always the most interesting ones. That's another thing, that's another thing. Let's say I wanna, so I'm a, again, I'm an Arab filmmaker, not necessarily a Palestinian, but you know, we're Arabs, so we come from, you know, conservative societies. This is how, you know, the world views us. So, to European funds, if I go and I write a story, uh, let's say I wanna get funding for a film, so I um, write this application to a European film fund, uh, and it's a story about, you know, a Palestinian kid who got shot by an Israeli soldier. Let's say my friend 
goes to the same fund and says, well, you know what? Here's my story. I want to write about a gay Palestinian, an LGBTQ Palestinian. The LGBTQ story would get funding before the story about the occupation. You know? Again, it's a, and, 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 and many people, unfortunately, and I'm saying this as a Palestinian artist, decide to write stories that will please Europeans, stories that Europeans or Americans, you know, Westerners would like to, you know, watch as opposed to stories, uh, as opposed to other stories. And I'm not saying that, you know, stories about LGBTQ people shouldn't be out there. There definitely should be more. But when it becomes the story that you know Europeans will fund and you write that story because you know it will get funded and that's why you choose not to do story not to write a story about the occupation it becomes a major problem. That's a huge I mean that's a huge huge problem. I think uh, we can be happy that we have uh, funding for the arts uh, in Europe for example but the criteria uh, of how, who gets money is sometimes something one really has to look very closely and I think there's not so much done in this, I don't know, maybe in the visual arts there is criticism on, 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 on these things. But I think in the visual arts it's also sometimes you, um, I mean when you talk about bringing people from uh, marginalized groups maybe, um, it's only that people want to hear this story. And maybe this is a bit in a contrary to what you were saying before, because I was a bit reminded when I was in a Palestine a short film festival three years ago, there was someone in the public asking the, the directors, so why haven't you done something about occupation? Or um, why haven't you chosen to yeah show apartheid or whatever? And they were mostly on like the stage and they were saying, well, actually, because this is like something that is all around me and sometimes I just don't feel like doing this. Um, that's, that's legit. That's, that's legit. And I wasn't saying that. Yeah, yeah. Again, I wasn't saying that. That's 100% that's legit. An artist, especially a Palestinian one, and especially an Arab one, should feel free to write whatever they want to write. But when they approach a certain fund with an idea that will only please them to get funding, it becomes a problem. You know, you know how many uh, scripts get funded? Uh, scripts about you know, social issues, internal social issues within Palestinian society inside of Israel? These stories can get Israeli funding. But if I go to an Israeli fund and I am critical of the establishment, Let's say there's right now, as we speak, there's an unprecedented crime wave within Palestinian and the Palestinian communities in Israel. Like each and every day, we have at least two, three murders. It's insane. And we're talking about not a very big community. So let's say I write a script, and in my script, I kind of go against, or I'm very critical of the Israel establishment that enables these murders. And you know, you know how, by the way, police, they don't solve the cases. Only like 8% of the cases get solved. It's insane. So murderers are just like out there and they continue to murder. So in my view, I mean, yeah, the establishment is to blame. And we've seen that and we've seen these, you know, stories happen with other indigenous communities around the world. You know, when crime, when you're infested with crime, then you don't go and demonstrate and protest against the state because you're dealing with this. You're busy dealing with internal social issues. So if I write a story about that and I blame the establishment, eh, maybe I won't get funding. But if I write a story about that and I blame my own society, yeah, they will fund me. They will give me a lot of funding and a lot of support. You know. So again, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. And unfortunately, there aren't enough funds in the Arab world to support. You know, films and music, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. But we live in a world, you know, I, I, again, you know how I funded my film? 
only one fund supported us, and I, because I did this with an American filmmaker, uh, I co-directed this film with Sarah Emma Friedland, who's a resident of New York State, so we got support from New York State Council on the Arts, but that was the only fund that supported us. Nowadays, we live in an age where we don't need these big funds. I mean, if you are creative enough, you can get funding. You approach philanthropists, you approach individuals, you do whatever it takes, you make crowdfunding campaigns, you whatever. You can fund your art uh, um, in a different way, not necessarily through funds. It's the, sh it's the longer route, but oftentimes it's the better route. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also like more Maybe you already gain a lot of community through the funding because they are interested in, in the end product. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, talking about community, I think we could uh, <laughs> open the discussion for, for the public. Um, so um, are there any questions here? We were talking long, sorry. <laughs> Maybe first of all, thank you so much for this great discussion. You touched on a lot of topics that are super interesting. So maybe a big applause first before we start with the. <laughs> and do we have any volunteers? Remind you it's recorded, so if you don't wanna. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks a lot and uh, interesting discussion and uh, more engaging than I, uh, than I thought initially about uh, the topic. So thank you, Rami, for bringing it all. Um, <laughs> should, we have, should we get offended now? Or should we, no, was no, that no, a compliment? No. We're, we're in what Switzerland. We're in Zurich. So this is good. This is good. You just didn't come with any expectations. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I, yeah. No, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on a topic which is a cultural appropriation. You didn't touch on it. Um, I mean, it, you have in the music industry the equivalent of the Israeli hummus, I'm sure, right? I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of theft of tunes, of melodies. One By Israelis? No. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> they so, never do that. <laughs> so in your cultural activism, both of you, I mean, do you, do you also attempt to expose that? I mean, you know, how do you deal with this? How do you make sure that the original, um, you know, melodies, tunes, everything to do with culture, I mean, they're, they're, they're still... Uh, not been, you know, um, well, stolen, right? Like anything else. So how, how do you combat that in your expos? If that's a good question, I'm not sure. But. Uh, should I go? No, that's a fantastic question. What's your name again? Samir. Samir, thank you for that question. It's a really good one. Um, I, I, I mean, what can we do? I mean, what can we do about, you know, to, 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 to just counter that? I have no idea. Like it's not really an issue with the Palestine Music Expo because it's an um, it's a, it's, a, it's just a Palestinian event. Uh, I can't do much about you know Israeli musicians appropriating you know Palestinian or Levant or Arab tunes, uh, other than write about it, other than just like you know be open about it, other than you know give talks about it, write articles, do interviews. Whatever, I mean, and I do that, I do that, I do touch on cultural appropriation. But sometimes cultural appropriation is actually a good thing. So I was in New York uh, this, uh, this April uh, when the encampment started in, uh, in US campuses. Um, so uh, we had started a theatrical run of our film, Lid, in uh, one of the theaters in New York. And you know, you know how it, you know how it goes. Like you do the Q and A, and afterwards, you know, you meet people and you go for drinks. So we went for drinks with a bunch of people, and they were all wearing kufiyas, like Palestinian kufiyas, except me, the only Palestinian. <laughs> so there's a bunch of people, you know, Asians, Latinos, uh, uh, white people, black people, Arabs. They were all wearing kufiyas. I wasn't wearing a kufiya, and then a discussion started. Um, whether they should be wearing or shouldn't be wearing kufiyas. You know what I said? On behalf of the entire Palestinian people, appropriate as much as you want. <laughs> We're good with this because for the first time ever, I got to walk the streets of New York and I got to see my grandfather's kufiyah 
everywhere. I got to see the Palestinian flag everywhere. I got to see people saying free Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine everywhere. So, you know, in that case, it was good appropriation. And then an Irish gentleman who was sitting at the table, he was wearing a keffiyeh that was green, <laughs> a green keffiyeh. Um, and I was happy to see his green keffiyeh because he had brought something from his own culture to my culture. Um, so I think now it's become a bit more complex to just say cultural appropriation is not good. Sometimes cultural appropriation is a good thing if it supports a good cause. Uh, you know, at Harvard Yard, Harvard University, uh, they one day uh, the students there decided to do a makluba day. You know, uh, for, for the non-Arabs in here, makluba is an Arab dish. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a Palestinian dish. Could be also an Egyptian dish. I don't know. Maybe it's a Levant dish. Lebanon, uh, they have it too. Yeah. But I just saw, I just saw these kids, these students, you know, doing my mom's cooking. My mom's cooking in the most important university in the world, you know, and they're filming this, and it's, go, it's going viral on social media. And as, again, when I think it, uh, cultural appropriation, dep it depends on where it stems from. If it's for a good cause, we support it. Because at the end of the day, someone is using your culture to promote a good cause, in our case, to stop the genocide, which is a pro-humanity cause. Uh, but when it's done by someone who, whose culture is to empty your culture, is to take from your culture to, you know, um, then it's wrong, then it's just wrong. And what can we do about it other than talk about it? Not much. But the good thing is that the world sees these things now, you know, and, um, and the world is changing in that sense. And on the and on the music side, I, I agree uh, with you, hundred percent, like ninety nine point five percent. And uh, on the music side, it's definitely also a question of uh, if an artist is referencing, give credit to where the music is coming from, and then it's a question also uh, about sometimes about money, you know. Uh, sometimes it's an homage and the artist that appropriates something and doesn't credit, he doesn't get a lot out of it. And then it's maybe, it's not the worst crime in the world, basically. But if like a super pop artists take a Syrian Dabke track and makes like a, a world hit, it's not so cool, yeah. And on the side of the curator, I think, for example, Norient, it would also, I think, be our responsibility not to invite the first artist that we see on the internet, basically. And to try to find, no, because sometimes the, there's some very smart artists that are super big on the internet, but it's not always the most interesting. Same discussion we already had. So it's, it's our, our role as curators also to find where something comes from. And is there maybe an artist that does this thing where it comes from that is much more interesting, but someone who has no time to post on social media or he hates post social media. I think that's our responsibility also, not to just invite the first Palestinian that we see, basically, but maybe the seventh. Actually, Rami was the first we saw on the internet, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just He's got lucky. Where are you? you just got lucky, man. You can't be lucky sometimes. But there is another question there. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Um, I wanted to have a follow-up question to this question um, about like the culture appropriation of Israeli society. Um, what is about the Mizrahi Jews who are from the Arab countries or like originally also have roots in Iraqi, Iranian, Syrian, Lebanese, Egypt countries? Um, if they do music um, with this kind of sound, is this then for you also culture appropriation? The problem with uh, some Mizrahi artists that do Arab music is that they don't consider it an Arab music. That's a problem. You just said uh, you just uh, talked about the credit thing. So when you go to some of these Mizrahi uh, artists and you tell them that this is well, this is an Arab music, this is an Arab tune, 
and they reject you and they not credit you know the original uh, and, and in many cases some of these tunes are stolen actually and uh, that's Vedatsa you know who are not even Mizrahi I mean you're an Israeli I'm assuming right yeah it's okay it's all, it's all good <laughs> Um, so I'm just like, there's an example of two Israeli artists that stole a tune from Amr Diab, who's a very well-known Egyptian artist. And they actually stole a tune from also Hamid al-Sha'rawi, who's another very famous Egyptian artist. Um, and they kind of counted on the fact that they won't get sued because, you know, a Palestinian, I'm sorry, an Egyptian artist won't sue an Israeli artist. So when you... There, there are different forms of appropriation. Sometimes it's straight out steal, just steal a tune from, from an Arab artist. And sometimes it's just a tune that, yeah, like you said, if I'm like a Lebanese Jew or an Egyptian Jew or whatever, like a Moroccan Jew, and I'm making the music that is, that is very, and I'm making a music that is very similar to the music I used to hear at my grandfather's place, then yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But problem beca but wh where, where does the problem start when you talk to these artists and they don't want to hear about, you know, the origins of the music, you know? You mean when like the, they don't, they're not willing to credit their own heritage. And we go, now we go into another discussion, which is the erasure of, you know, Arab culture within Mizrahi Jews or Middle Eastern culture within Mizrahi Jews that is being practiced by the Israeli establishment, you know? And it's a bit maybe, I don't know, it's a bit off topic maybe of the music thing, but you said about like the empty values, and then I asked myself, what does justice looks for you? Um, what you stand for, because my thing, my first thought was like, um, how to say, uh, movements like standing together or combatants for peace. I probably, you heard of them living in Israeli society, mm -hmm. and um, there are a lot of Palestinian people there also, and Israelis. Yeah, and I work with them. Okay, so, but because they are also standing kind of for, they say for justice, but also for the stance of a society built on equal rights, but like with the thing of also coexistence. If you drill right? down, yeah. if you drill down, um, and they're, you know, core values, these are really good people. Like, I don't have a problem with Israelis who join uh, standing together or combats for peace or whatever, because at the end of the day, they want equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis and all people living from the river to the sea. How can you not support that? There are nuances between us, but I don't view them as the enemy. I actually give talks to standing together. I work with them. I combine forces with them all the time. Like, I... As a Palestinian, I seek justice. And I believe that peace is a by byproduct of justice. It's, peace is just a side effect. It shouldn't be like the end game. You aspire to achieve justice, and then trust me, peace will come naturally. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. These, these were two really good questions. What's your name? Susan. Susan, thank you. To the rabbi. Or like, shukram. Baksha. There is another that question. was a coexistence moment, you see? Oh, wow. No, she's one of the good ones. In, in neutral Switzerland, no? Um, I have a question for Thomas. Uh, you mentioned towards the beginning of the discussion that you wouldn't participate or do peace building projects where you get Palestinian artists and uh, artists from Israel together in Switzerland. What is the reason behind that? I mean, do you sp I talked about the past, basically, as well, you know. I, the reason behind it is because the things that Rami also, I think, said, that sometimes the artists that are selected in these, uh, in these projects are not necessarily the artists that interest me uh, artistically. That's basically the... It's also the divide that you sometimes have with uh, stuff funded by arts councils and artists fund funded by NGOs or embassies. It's like a, it's a, an artistic 
aesthetical question at the end of the day. Also, maybe if I can add something, that was also what I meant when I asked you about how, do, how responsible do you feel for the artists that you invite? I mean, I would feel in my, in my personal, like if I curate a show and I invite uh, Israeli and Palestinian artists, I mean, I wouldn't know how comfortable the Palestinian side like would would feel also because you can never be sure like uh, it's like I don't know putting people together and then you're like sitting next to someone that supports genocide so it's like really also like a respect that you maybe have for for the artists that you invite I agree and that's sometimes also a case that was like this curator from the Netherlands, she did like this event in Melkweg in Amsterdam. Uh, Israeli artists, Turkish artists, and Lebanese artists. It was after the 2006 war. And then uh, the Lebanese artists, they were okay with the Israeli artists because they respected them artistically. But they said, we cannot be on the same poster, we cannot be in the same leaflet. And all these questions are important to, to follow and not just ignore, you know, because these artists might have big problems in Beirut when they come back. Oh yeah, the, the Lebanese artists can be on the same like poster with an Israeli artist. I mean, they'd get arrested when they're in Lebanon. Yeah. I think even on stage, on some cases, it's yeah, very difficult, yeah. 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 We have another question. <laughs> Thank you very much, but like, out of curiosity, what was like your worst moment when you thought like you weren't sensible enough, just like when you're curating, you're gatekeeping actually, right? And like in hindsight, where you stand, stand there and like say, this shouldn't have happened. Very good question. <laughs> oh, I have to think quickly. <laughs> So uh, it's not just in curatorship. I mean, this happens all the time. So I used to have a daily TV show where we expose gay, like fake news. I'd have uh, like uh, like each and each episode was like eight minutes long or nine minutes long, and it would be cons it it consisted of two sometimes three segments. You know how many times? And I'm the gatekeeper, man. I'm the host of the fucking show. You know how many times I said, "Ah, oh, man, we shouldn't have done this." This was a bad segment. This was a bad topic. We shouldn't have done this. We have caused more harm than good. It just happens, you know. If part of you know being out there, whether if you're a curator behind the scene, behind the scenes, whether you're you know an editor, whether you're a host, whether when you choose to do, you just put yourself at risk. You know. That's, so it comes with the territory. I mean, I, I approach every project you know, with this psychological readiness, knowing that I might fuck up. It is what it is. Yeah, that, I agree again. <laughs> you you agree you. too much. I agree really all the time. I think, uh, I mean, one thing that comes to my mind that I felt a bit embarrassed afterwards, uh, I think there is, if I, if I think for 20 minutes, there might be a better thing. But what comes to my mind is I was DJing uh, in front of uh, Omar Suleiman. He's a, a Syrian, Syrian uh, musician. And uh, it was in the week where the Syrian war started. And there were a lot of Syrian uh, people in the audience. In was he famous back then? Yeah, he was uh, known. He was in, a, in trend. He was a trend, yeah. So I was DJing there. And then me and my friend, we played this anti-Assad song. And then like Suleiman and his manager, they just came running. The audience was applauding and celebrating like crazy. But Suleiman and the manager, they, were, they came like guys. They were so afraid, you know. And uh, you bring us so much trouble with this, you know. So I felt really bad about it. Uh, I think nothing happened. Thank God, but uh, I, f I felt embarrassed by it, yeah. Okay, there's another question. 
trying to think of an embarrassing story that happened to me too. There are just so many. I'm just like brain dead. Just like well, let's to come go up to the one. next question. <laughs> My brain is it's about very to smart, yeah, yeah. You tackled us. So first of all, thank you all so much. It's been wonderful. I love the bit about the Luba being appropriated everywhere. I'm all for that. And as a Syrian, I must first concede that the best luba is made by Palestinians. So if a Palestinian, <laughs> if they offer you to make matluba, just take it on the spot. <laughs> so my question is about, um, you talked about music and art and film being political. Uh, I, I always got the perception that uh, when I was younger, like in the 80s and 90s, and then of course listening to the 60s, 70s rock, and then 80s, 90s hip hop, music was very political, or much more political than it is now. And then there's been this period where it got super apolitical, or at least whatever you see in the mainstream does not have politics uh, in it. And then I get the perception that there's a shift now, and I don't know if it's how real it is, uh, maybe with the new generation, that it, there is a hunger for art and music and mainstream art to be more political again, perhaps uh, uh, facilitated and galvanized by what's going on in our world. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, what's your perception of that? Is this as real as it looks to me? And uh, do you guys feel like there's an opportunity there that you're you're seizing? I think uh, what is political also changes generation by, by generation. You know, I think uh, there's different ways of being political. And I think every generation takes another route. They're all, they don't always don't like the one that the others talk, told. For, ex for example, uh, in Beirut, where I did my PhD, uh, a lot of people, surprisingly, maybe for some, for many of you, were very critical about uh, Marcel Khalife, uh, Sharbal El Haber, all these leftist artists. The artists of my that I talked to, they were saying like these guys making poems out of catastrophes. You know, they're 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 singing songs, beautiful songs about war, about people dying. And the generation that I worked with, they were more uh, recording the bombs and the field recordings and things like this. Or they would, they would bring forward very daily stories, you know, in a way, stories about their daily life, what doesn't work. And it's, it's very hidden. It's a different way of, of politicizing. Uh, I agree. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, uh, and I, I don't, did, 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 um, it's been almost uh, 90 minutes and we're yet to give a shout out to Gaza, I think. And we owe a lot to Gaza at the moment. When you see mainstream artists, like the biggest selling artists in the world out there, like Dua Lipa, you know, for example, going on her Instagram and, you know, free Palestine, free Gaza, and she's still selling. She's still saying, selling. Her career is doing tremendously well. You know, artists are not afraid anymore. Uh, so, yeah, if you listen to Dua Lipa's music, it's pop. You know, it's like, you know, love and whatever. I don't really listen to Dua Lipa. I don't know what she sings about, but I'm assuming it's about love, right? <laughs> but she's not afraid to be political at the same time. And uh, I think we're witnessing history in that sense. Um, and we all, again, we owe the people of Gaza so much, so much. And years to come, we will still be discovering how they change the world in that sense. Also, I think it's maybe a, a um, privilege that we have in the Western world or living in the Western world that we can like make music that is apolitical and that's maybe also that m many people were uh, enjoying in the last few years. And that, yeah, that they just didn't understand that music that comes from other contexts um, was always political. And uh, it, they are just like, maybe also through globalization or also like the, the, the digital turn uh, coming back to, um, yeah, develop, uh, like, um, 
uh, see that this music exists and what it what music or art can also um, be. Yeah, and I think it's also it's also important. I don't want to give the wrong impression in a way when I talk badly about NGOs and all these projects. At the end of the day, I think it's important that we have a diversity of opinions here also in, 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 in Switzerland, you know. I, I'm not the one that would invite an NGO artist in a way, but I'm in a way glad that these projects also exist. Maybe you're not so glad because they take the fund away from you. I don't know. Are you glad that these projects exist in Europe? No, I never really attend. <laughs> <laughs> so think of an example and we can discuss it. Yeah, maybe we, we postponed that discussion with beers and wine. Um, I think it was a good point. Um, it is a privilege to be not politicized, but also apolitical. That is true. Law can be very political, I guess, uh, especially from the region a lot of us also come from. So in that sense, if there is not any other question, I would like to thank you. Oh, there is. <gasps> People don't want to go home, man. Yeah, I don't know, man. We're just melting here. But yeah, it's it's, good. Uh, I, yeah, I was actually thinking about you, but obviously, so. Yeah, the spotlights are really cooking us in here. It's like... uh, hi, yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the great panel talk. Um, my question is going to be about the, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the censorship going in institutions in Central Europe and Western Europe not only of uh, Palestinians and the Palestinians' cause, but also anyone who voices support for this cause. And since the art world is, you know, a bit uh, depending on institutional funding a lot, what would you propose as a solution of, you know, not maybe dismantling this, this system right away, but at least gaining a leverage against these institutions when it comes to uh, promoting art? thinking <laughs> I think it's a it's a slow it's a slow pro process also I've been in some funding institutions like of the canton of Bern Swiss Arts Council Pro Helvetia and basically you have like it depends really on the on the people that are inside these committees you know at the end of the day and sometimes there is someone above that uh, has uh, censorship no, but not so often. To be honest, I think it's, it, from my experience, it's really in these committees. And I know it sometimes if, if these people change, things also change. But if people stay forever, it never changes. So basically what I would propose, uh, it's on a small scale, is that in these, uh, on these boards, people can only stay for four years and not for ten. Things like this, small things, you know. So, uh, I'm not sure whether I should share this example or not, so I'm going to share it anyway. Um, so, you're familiar with the controversy around Art Forum magazine, right? Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, Art Forum magazine, probably the most important, like, you know, art magazine out there or something like that, uh, fired their editor, David Velasco, at the beginning of the war for publishing an open letter calling for a ceasefire. At the time, it was very fashionable to say, screw all Palestinians, you know? Um, saying stop the war or end the ethnic cleansing or all that and free Palestine was akin to being charged of murder, in, especially in American mainstream. So David got fired, but then the tide shift. And now in the art world and, you know, it's becoming more mainstream. I experienced this in the States while I was touring with my film. It's become more mainstream to say free Palestine and to recognize that a genocide is taking place and that there is an apartheid system in Israel-Palestine. So we were approached by the same magazine. They wanted to, to do a spread about my film and about two other Palestinian films. So, you know, such a big magazine approaches you and they want to do a spread about you and they actually send me the text in advance. I got to read what they wrote. It was, oh my God, it was just like in my wildest dreams, 
I could never have like anticipated such a glowing review. Uh, and of course, I wanted it in, in, in the magazine, but something didn't feel right. So I got hold of David Velasco, the former editor, and I asked him about you know, whether we should be in that magazine or not. And he said, listen, man, they're not willing to uh, recognize that I was, I was fired for political reasons. So as a Palestinian who's been persecuted myself by Israelis, and I, I know what it feels like to, to be on the stand and to be smeared and to be bashed and to, ha to have received death threats. And well, I wasn't fired, but you know, I did the first season of my show. I co-founded a show that was a historically huge success but I didn't go on to the second season because of the newly elected fascist government. Just I couldn't continue doing my show uh, um, with this new atmosphere. So I felt for David and I decided to pull out. I decided to pull out. I'm not gonna be a fig leaf. My film is not going to be a fig leaf. Again, it was a discussion with my film partner who was an American and she was fully supportive. She wanted to pull out as well. So what did we, it felt like we had lost from not being there, but at the same time, I gained so much. You know, I show solidarity to the guy that supported us when it wasn't fashionable to support us. So, but that story also told me because I saw, and the new editor in charge really meant well. She really meant well. And she said all the right things, and she was really pushing for you know having more Palestinian voices and all of that. And it's the same magazine that tried to silence pro-Palestinian voices. So you do notice the shift in the you know art world, especially in the mainstream, mainly in the mainstream. That's what I'm talking about. And I think it, it's a gradual and slow process. At the end, you know, we will topple the old you know, system, the old, you know, uh, hierarchies in this, in this world. Gatekeepers, these old ga gatekeepers will fall eventually. It's just a gradual process. We're just getting started. This is not going to change within a day and night. It's going to take a while. So, um, I, I, again, um, I'm, I keep going back to the U.S. I know the situation is different in Europe, but I've seen, I, I, I've been following U.S. media. I know I'm familiar with you, American culture. I know how hard it is to say that the occupation of Palestine is a bad thing. <laughs> and I know the repercussions, and I know what people pay for going against Israel. And I've been, see I've, I've been seeing stuff I've never thought I'd, I'd get to see. Um, so I think it's a slow and gradual process, but at the end, it will change.